Hello and welcome to the Smart Recovery Podcast, your audio headquarters for inspiring and insightful discussions on the topic of addiction recovery. What you'll hear with us will be self-empowering, science-based, and stigma-free. We believe you have the power within yourself to make changes that will move you toward a more satisfying life. And we hope these messages and interviews with leading addiction experts and advocates will help you believe that too. Remember that the purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. It is not a substitute for medical care from a doctor or other qualified medical professionals. Before making any changes in your treatment plan, please discuss your thoughts with your medical provider. Today's guest on the podcast is Bill Greer, current board president of SMART. He has spent the past three years presenting SMART to the organization's stakeholders, chairing the SMART USA Communications Committee, chairing the SMART Recovery International's Brand and Communications Committee, all while serving as president at a time of great change in how treatment and recovery are understood. Bill also devoted significant time leading SMART Recovery International's initial effort to define the SMART model and brand for the international community. Bill has an intellectual background grounded in science, philosophy, and religion, with a master's in journalism from the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University, and a BA with honors from Lawrence University. He draws upon all these disciplines in understanding and leading SMART. Additionally, Bill has facilitated almost every type of SMART meeting, including the most challenging ones for inmates in maximum security jails, for which he has earned awards, and for family and friends. Bill also has the lived experience of growing up with family members suffering from addiction and using SMART to recover from his own addiction and other major life challenges. Welcome, Bill. Thank you very much, Luke. Good to be here. Today, uh, we're going to focus on language as it relates to the field of, of helping those with addictive behavior. Bill recently wrote a fascinating article, can be found on SMART Recovery website, amending some words used to describe smart recovery stance on abstinence from addictive and problematic behavior. But before we dive into that article specifically, I'd like to first talk about how smart recovery has historically been very outspoken about other terminology regarding people and approaches to recovery, starting with not using the terms addict and alcoholic. Can you tell us more about why the words alcoholic and addict are not used in smart recovery? Yes, Luke. I think uh, smart recovery has always been mindful of the adverse or stigmatizing effect of certain labels can have on people and their recovery efforts. Uh, I mean, obviously, the most classic examples are addict and alcoholic, or worse, uh, names like junkie or or dealer, or uh, even the word clean is is something that I think can be problematic for some people. I think it it has a an effect on people where they just they confuse um, who they are with the behavior they're trying to change. So they they have a sense that they're a bad person or they're you know they're not a they're a person with a serious uh, problem and it's an identity issue that that comes into play. And and really all they have is a behavioral problem that they need to fix, albeit a a significant behavioral problem. But as Smart tries to help people, we try to help them uh, differentiate between who they are and the behavior they need to change. And and if you're confusing the behavior with their identity by calling them an addict or an alcoholic or a junkie, uh, I think that has an adverse effect on many people's efforts to to make the changes needed to recover. It can be very discouraging. Uh, Now, in some cases, people find using those labels works for them. I, I understand that. But for a lot of people, I think SMART has discovered that those labels do not work and can have an adverse uh, impact on their recovery efforts. Sure, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and you even mentioned the word clean, because then what is the opposite or what is the, uh, what's opposed to clean is dirty. Yeah, and, and and funny, I, and we all kind of automatically use that term. I, I still do it. I, it's in my head and every time I say it, I, I try to catch myself. But uh, that some of these words are really ingrained in our, in our vocabulary, and we have to really be careful about that. I think it's smart. We know that uh, quite a lot because we understand um, how the, the thoughts that we're uh, uh, giving to our recovery efforts and our addiction, the, the words that we're using to describe it can have a pretty serious effect on on our, our efforts to recover and, and uh, how we're motivated and, and uh, dealing with the changes that we need to make. Need to make. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. But again, before we start talking about abstinence-oriented versus abstinence-based, are there any other kinds of language that SMART discourages or asks facilitators not to use? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I think there's a lot of words we have to be careful about, uh, and, and particularly the meaning that, that people attach to them. Even the word relapse, for example, um, uh, came out as a uh, difficult term for some people uh, looking at the research that was presented at our conference last September. Um, it, you know, it came out, the research shows that um, about 75% of people who try to recover are, are going to have relapses in the first year of their, of their recovery. Um, you know, 75%, three in four people. Um, and if, they're, if those relapses make them think that their recovery has totally failed, and, and they're, you know, they have this meaning attached to relapses that suggests that they're, they're you know, failing at their addiction efforts, that's a very demotivating factor as well. Um, I'm not suggesting necessarily we not use that term, although perhaps the word lapse or slip might be a, a better alternative. But in SMART, we, we try to help people understand what relapses mean and, and um, the, the opportunity that they provide to improve and fine tune your recovery effort and, uh, and not see them as such a, a negative uh, event in the recovery effort because they're a very common event and mm -hmm. something you really have to be prepared for. And that includes not only the people who are recovering, but their family members and friends. Mm -hmm. um, and and it'd be helpful if they would see relapses in a in a more positive, not a positive light, but a less negative light. Let's mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, so that Carlo, might. I'm sorry. I think Carlo Di Clemente suggested the term recycle. I don't know if that one works necessarily, but I think people are having trouble with that term as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a there's a sensitivity there, even if it's not an absolute, uh, uh, you know, instruction, I guess, to facilitators. And, and, and just to follow up, that's very true that it doesn't mean if you have a, a lapse or a slip, it doesn't mean that everything you've learned or the time that you spent addressing your problematic behavior then is, is uh, for naught. Absolutely. And that's something that I think we emphasize a lot in our meetings, the classic uh, uh, analogy that we often use is say you're you know you're driving a car from uh, well I live in Washington D.C. and say I'm driving to Boston and I get a flat tire in um, in, in uh, New York on uh, my way to Boston. Now I, I don't change the flat tire and drive back to Washington D.C. <laughs> and you know in effect start my journey all over again. I, I change the tire and uh, you know looking at that as a relapse and then proceed to my ultimate destination which is Boston. So I think that's you know, that's how we look at relapse is uh, an opportunity to learn, fix what's wrong, uh, strengthen your recovery efforts and and uh, and do what you need to do to, to succeed ultimately. Yeah. OK, so let's let's switch to that article. Um, and one thing right away that I noticed was that in the article that you're noting the change in wording from the term abstinence based, you write quote, we adopted the abstinence-oriented term to distance SMART from dangerous and misinformed views about the use of medications. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I guess there's some personal uh, history I can share with that. When I joined the SMART Recovery Board about three years ago, um, I was uh, asked to join because of my background in communications. I started paying very close attention to the way um, recovery was being talked about, and um, and then particularly uh, looking at the opioid epidemic, which is uh, very much in the news, uh, still is, obviously. And I, I started seeing uh, stories and headlines that simply declared that abstinence-based uh, treatment does not work. Uh, people who are um, uh, under, uh, people who are trying to use that approach and recovering from opioid use disorder um, are, are not succeeding with an abstinence-based uh, approach. And that, that kind of struck me as, uh, what, what's going on here? Um, and, and then I, I realized that when they talked about abstinence-based, uh, they were referring to abstaining also, not only from the, the heroin or the, or the pills or, or whatever it was they were addicted to, but also from the medications, the opioid agonists, methadone, buprenorphine, 
uh, that they uh, that they needed as part of their recovery process. And and so I was finding out. I'm not. I guess it's not news to a lot of people that that um, an important part of recovering from uh, opioid use disorder is is having access to these medications. Uh, because they're very important in, in protecting people uh, essentially from fatal overdoses um, and also helping them uh, uh, sustain themselves uh, during the recovery process. But I guess there there has been this idea, and there still is quite wide, widespread in the United States, that uh, that when you're using these uh, medications, you're not really in recovery. You are you are not clean, in fact. That, that is exactly how that's often described. And uh, and so people who are using medications to try to recover from opioid use disorders are, 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 are not seen as in recovery. And, and they're, so there's a, I, I noticed there's, there's a tendency or there's a, still a trend in treatment to not use those medications. I think the medications are not available still in a lot of places because even in the treatment community, there still is a sense that using these medications is not really um, an, a, a valuable part of recovery. There's this idea that using these medications is simply, quote, substituting one drug for another, uh, because these medications do have small amounts of opioids uh, in them. So the, the notion is because they have opioids in them, uh, you're not really recovering, you're not clean, you're not pure and, and taking and being entirely off uh, opioids. Even though the reason you have the, those medications that, are, that have small amounts of opioids is to, is to maintain your tolerance to opioids so that if and when you do relapse, which unfortunately, as I indicated earlier, is extremely common, you're, you're not endangering yourself or your health because it's not, it's, it's pretty common, uh, unfortunately, for people to have very serious health consequences uh, when they relapse uh, and they're trying to recover from opioid use disorder. They're, when their tolerance level goes way down during the recovery process, um, when they relapse, um, that can overwhelm their system, lead to respiratory shutdown, and kill them. Uh, the, the, a lot of the overdose, a lot of the opioid overdoses are are due to that very uh, phenomenon. You have you have fifty thousand people dying a year now from opioid overdoses. I don't I don't know what the percentage is, but a large number of those people are people who are actually trying to recover. I mean that's that's incredible to me. The, the people who are trying to recover and, and are being told they can't use these medications are the ones who are, in many cases, who are dying from the overdoses. I mean, that, that doesn't make sense to me at all. I, I just find that incredibly awful. And, and when, I, when I see that abstinence-based programs are, are, are being associated with, with this problem, I, I said, whoa, wait, we don't want SMART to be uh, associated with this kind of treatment. So that made me start to think, you know, we really don't want to be in that space where people understand abstinence-based recovery is, is uh, um, meaning you can't use these medications as well. Now, SMART has always allowed the use of medications, uh, even before we were talking about the, the agonists, but I, I think we felt that we needed this word change to help uh, distinguish SMART from the so-called abstinence-based programs that uh, in many cases were proving to be very dangerous to people trying to recover from opioid use disorders. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we thought of eliminating the term abstinence altogether, but um, that's really not something that we can do easily in the United States. And uh, so abstinence-oriented uh, seemed to be the best uh, alternative uh, right now. And, and, uh, and that applies to you know, our efforts to help people recover from all kinds of drugs and substances that you have to abstain from completely uh, and ultimately when you're when you're trying to recover in many cases. Yeah. I find that a very significant point and you do uh, touch on that or go a little bit into depth in your article by talking about uh, abstinence-based recovery being dangerous because uh, as you write, this recovery method kills people when the opioid addicted are not allowed to take agonists or pushed to get off those medications before the recovery is secure enough to prevent relapses. I mean, that's the that's the point you're making. It is actually dangerous, not just a matter of uh, preference or or such. And I'm not the only one saying that. I mean, I think a lot of experts in the field are are saying that as as a, a matter of a public policy, as as a, as the gold standard in treating people for opioid use disorder. When people have a severe opioid addiction. Um, they really have to use these, these agonists to, to help them recover safely. 
and, and they may have to use these agonists for a very long time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, it would be nice if they didn't have to, but if the alternative is risking your life, I, I don't think that's a hard choice to make. Yeah. And I want um, smart to be associated with, with uh, recovery that allows those uh, medications to be used and, and doesn't stigmatize people who are using these medications so that they can have a place to go and, and talk about their recovery and, and be accepted and, and their recovery being supported. So we want smart meetings to be a place where people using medication-assisted uh, treatment can go and, and get the recovery support that they need. Yeah, again, it's quite an, a significant um, kind of uh, statement and idea that both, as you said, you and others have, have written about. Um, let me ask you this, Bill, how might you respond to the view that the word changes we're talking about is, is kind of much ado about nothing? Well, I hope I made that clear. <laughs> if we're talking about life and death here, I mean, I guess maybe to an outsider, you know, saying you know, abstinence-based versus abstinence-oriented may may not seem like a huge change, but I think within the addiction field, when when abstinence-based um, you know precludes or uh, dis discourages the use of, the, of these uh, life-saving medications, I, I don't think that distinction uh, I mean, that distinction becomes extremely important. And when we want people to understand that our orientation towards abstinence allows the use of these medications. So we, we don't want to be in the same group as, as people who are, um, you know, preventing the use of medications for people trying to recover. So you know, oriented is, is one way of preserving our, our abstinence uh, orientation, our abstinence focus, which is what smart meetings do. I mean, we, we help people learn how to stop engaging in addictive behavior. We want people to you know, understand we're still uh, doing that in, in our, our program. We're, we're not a moderation program, as some people like to think, and, and it's not really true, where we help people stop addictive behavior. And we need to maintain that uh, understanding as, as people are looking at SMART and trying to understand where we fit in the recovery field, and, and at least in the United States. Mm. Well, that gets exactly to this point that I know you spent a great deal of your career in, in communications related uh, positions, leadership positions. Um, so there is kind of a, a, a fundamental belief that there is a power to language. Yes, well, language is extremely powerful. Um, I've, I've seen, uh, well, I mean, I could look at Mark Twain's famous statement, which I, I always liked. Uh, uh, as a writer, the difference between the almost right word and the right word um, is the difference between the lightning bug and the lightning. Uh, <laughs> so that's when I'm writing, I'm always thinking about, you know, trying to figure out the best words to use and describing something. And, and I'm, you know, as you know, you're a writer, too, we, we always try to work on that quite a lot. But I, I think in my career, and I, I've been involved in a number of legislative campaigns, uh, major ones that have uh, uh, involved Congress, um, and, I, and I've seen single words or phrases uh, meaning the difference in the success or failure of, a, of, of huge legislative campaigns. A classic example years ago, I don't know, people may recall the, the um, campaign to eliminate the estate tax. When they, when they called that the death tax, that, that term really had made a huge difference mm, in how uh -huh. they viewed that particular right. issue. Um, a more recent example I was very involved in um, uh, was uh, efforts to eliminate so-called interchange fees that credit cards and banks charge when you uh, when you uh, make a credit card transaction. When we were calling these interchange fees, and this is a two to three percent charge that's assessed on every single uh, transaction that somebody makes with a credit card. Um, you know, what what does an interchange fee mean? But when we started calling those swipe fees. Uh, which kind of connotes that something's being stolen, <laughs> which is yeah, the right. point that we wanted to make. Well, that, that made a huge difference in, in how that campaign now was, was going. And, and ultimately, um, I was with the retail uh, organizations that were, that were fighting these interchange fees. That, that had a lot to do with, the, with some of the success of this uh, um, legislative effort. I think sure. in the, in the, when you get to the field of addiction, though, your words start to take a, a much more serious uh, importance because of, uh, of the fact we're dealing with serious health issues. And, and as I indicated earlier, when, when we're dealing with you know, life or death, if you're using the wrong words and, and that can influence people to 
not take the kind of medication that they need to take or or in their recovery efforts to think that they failed um, and they're not succeeding because they relapsed. Um, I think people who are trying to recover already have a very um, negative view of themselves. They, they feel ashamed and, and they're, they're trying to recover their, their identity and their self sense of self-confidence and uh, uh, the, the words that people are using uh, and just in their thought process uh, internally and how people are describing them are extremely important. Uh, I mean, SMART understands how thoughts and beliefs have a lot to do with uh, your recovery. And if you can uh, figure out the right way to describe those thoughts and understand those beliefs, uh, uh, your recovery can, can go a lot better and, and uh, progress further. Yeah. And of course, that's cognitive, uh, cognitive training, cognitive behavioral kinds of approaches. But Absolutely. Um, kind of getting uh, wrapping up uh, here in a couple minutes. Um, are there any other language or communication issues that SMART plans to address in the future? I don't actually not not immediately, I think. But, uh, you know, it's funny that the one thing that, that uh, I, I got into when I was um, trying to figure out how to present SMART from a branding standpoint. I was I was very involved with SMART Recovery International in, in the year 2018, starting a, a branding initiative, initiative, trying to figure out what, what makes SMART different from all the other uh, recovery support programs, um, you know, what makes SMART, SMART special, and, and how can we distinguish ourselves um, from all the others? And and it really wasn't the term abstinence-based or abstinence-oriented. It was it was beyond that. I think the fact that we're focusing on recovery and life beyond uh, addiction uh, became a, a real important part of, of what distinguishes SMART uh, from other uh, approaches to recovery. Um, and, and I think as, as we go forward in trying to present SMART, not only to the United States uh, audience, but to the world, I think we need to focus on the positive aspects of our program and how we pick, help people not just stop the uh, addictive behavior that they're engaging in, but but building a new life and renewing their life uh, with a with a new lifestyle and healthy uh, activities that support that in um, in their in their full and long term recovery. As we know, in our, our point four of the Smart program, it's uh, building a new life, learning how to lead a healthy and fulfilling life that that really makes a difference in determining whether you recover. For the long term, uh, just stopping the the behavior is only the first step. It's a critical step, but but unless you get that new lifestyle together, that those new behaviors, that healthy lifestyle, a sense of purpose in life, you know that's what recovery is all about long term, and that's what we help people accomplish in Smart. And I think that's one of the things that makes Smart Smart um, distinctive uh, from other groups. Our emphasis on on leading a, a balanced and fulfilling and purposeful life. Right. Those are excellent points, Bill, and I appreciate how well you're able to bring those to the forefront and, and describe them, because I think, and also those those examples you used about the power of language, uh, really great stuff, and, and I appreciate that. Um, finally, is there anything else you'd like listeners to consider about the change from abstinence-based uh, to abstinence-oriented? I think, I think associated with that, I, I think it's important that facilitators um, and regional coordinators and others who speak uh, on behalf of our program you know, need to be emphasizing that, that our acceptance of people who are using medication-assisted uh, treatment. I think that point needs to be brought out um, a lot more uh, uh, forcefully so that the people who are using that treatment really understand it. I, I did a, a, a Facebook Live event with a with a group called um, uh, Faces of, uh, of Opioids, um, a group that has like 60,000 people who are recovering from opioid addiction or, or have lost loved ones to opioid addiction. And you know, when, they, when they learn that SMART exists and we have this whole program that, that accepts people who are using medication-assisted treatment, they were just delighted to find that out because a lot of their members were, were encountering a lot of resistance at meetings uh, where they were not accepted because they were using medication-assisted treatment, and and many of them were, were stopping that treatment because of that, or or um, or trying to get off that treatment uh, prematurely, and and then they were they were, they were just delighted to find out they have you know we had this smart program and, and we have an increasing number of meetings to to support them uh, 
and, and I think it's important that facilitators uh, emphasize that as, as they're as they're talking to people in their meetings and and welcoming more people who are trying to recover from opioid use disorders. I think particularly that's happening in, in among younger people who we need to attract to our meetings in greater numbers. So I, I think that would be a, another message I'd like to emphasize. Mm, okay. Well, that's uh, again a great point and a great uh, explanation of some of the differences that SMART how they approach how. Uh, the, the field of dealing with addictive behavior. We've been speaking with uh, Bill Greer, board president of Smart Recovery USA. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for uh, contributing both the article and uh, this podcast. Thank you, Luke. Thanks for listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. If you found today's episode helpful and inspiring, we encourage you to share it with someone who might need to hear its messages. If you or someone you know needs addiction-related help, We encourage you to visit smartrecovery.org to find a wealth of digital resources, practical tools, and social supports meant to help you and your loved ones on their recovery journey. While there, you can search for a local smart meeting near you or join our online community to find 24-7 access to recovery help through regular online meetings and helpful message boards and forums. All of our meetings and online community resources are completely free of charge. Be sure to connect with us online to get more helpful addiction-related resources. Visit our website at smartrecovery.org, where you can search for local meetings, join our online community, subscribe to our e-newsletter, and find regular blogs, videos, podcasts, and more. You can also help us to spread our self-empowering, science-based messages to more people who need to hear from them in important ways. First, get trained on the Smart Recovery Program. If you are a licensed healthcare provider and could benefit from using Smart Recovery in your professional work, or if you are someone who would like to volunteer and lead Smart Recovery meetings in your community, please check out our training and volunteer opportunities at www.smartrecovery.org training. Second, donate to support our work. Smart Recovery is a nonprofit that runs on the donations from generous supporters who understand the need for recovery-related support. If you would like to help us reach more people, consider donating to Smart Recovery at smartrecovery.org slash donate. We'd like to thank U.S. World Meds for their generous support of this episode. We'll see you next time on the next episode of the Smart Recovery Podcast.